Okay. Mm-hmm. Islam is not as capitalist minded, but guess what? It is still anti-revolutionary. It is still anti-African culture in many regards. I was raised Muslim. Philadelphia has the largest percentage of African-American Sunni Orthodox Muslims in the United States. Mm-hmm. Dearborn has the most Muslims overall, but they Arab. Yeah. If you're dealing with American Africans, non-nation of Islam, Orthodox Muslim, yeah. Philadelphia has more than any city in America. I was raised in it. Yeah. I was raised in the very masjid that I believe the nation of Islam used to own. You understand? Before W. Warrithud Dean Muhammad took over his father's organization, shut that down, and came with the American Muslim movement. I was raised in one of those mosques. You understand? Mm-hmm. But I had to walk away because I saw how we completely ignored black people's problems. We completely mm-hmm. ignored black culture. We completely ignored the black reality. It was all Islam. Learn your Arabic. And I'm like, I'm up, I'm a practicing Arab. Mm-hmm. I'm not practicing Islam. I'm practicing Arabism. Why do I gotta learn Arab language to worship God? Why do I gotta eat like the Arab to worship God? Why do I gotta dress like the Arab to worship God? This is not the worship of God. This is the deification of Arabic culture. Mm-hmm. And that's why I walked away from it. And now African spirituality is my foundation. But that would have never happened had I never go to Africa in 2005 and go into that Gory Island slave dungeon and them ancestors literally grabbed me that day and I went through a whole spiritual renaissance in my hotel room literally that day. And that's what brought me to African spirituality. I was deluged, if you will, with video responses to comments by my and our dear brother dr umar johnson so it's very unfortunate that he decided to leave islam and it sounds like he had a a negative experience i can't speak on the specific history that he went through or the community that he comes from however i'm just going to share some thoughts and some facts about islam So while Muslims and people within the Muslim community might fall short of its teachings, or rather I should say definitely fall short of its teachings, Islam itself doesn't actually teach some of the things that he had an issue with in his video. So the first thing that he said was, We completely ignored black people's problems. We completely ignored black culture. We completely ignored the black reality. So not only does the religion of Islam not teach us to ignore, as he put it, black people's problems, but if anything, Islam teaches us to actually help people overcome their problems. And the only reason I'm even mentioning the word black people is because this is what he's mentioning, because Islam doesn't differentiate between people based on their color. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, explicitly stated this in his quote where he said, there's no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab, or a non-Arab over an Arab, nor a white person over a black person, nor a black person over a white person, except in piety. So the only thing that makes one person better than another person is their piety, their righteousness. And this is something that we find repeated in the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For example, in the Quran, Allah tells us, O mankind, indeed we have created you from a male and a female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and aware. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, also taught us that indeed Allah does not look at your outer appearances or your wealth, but rather he looks at your hearts and your deeds. And I could go on and on. Islam teaches us that we all come from Adam, the first human being that Allah made. We all are part of the same tribe in that we are the tribe of Prophet Adam, the first human being. But of course, over time throughout history, we became smaller and more specific tribes that speak different languages and have different cultures which segues into what he said about black culture. There's a well-known foundational principle in Islam that teaches when it comes to culture, when it comes to our daily lives, everything by default is permissible. The only time something becomes impermissible is if there is a proof against it. We don't have to dress like an Arab. We don't have to eat like an Arab. Now, with that said, there is one specific thing that is important that is linked to the Arabs, and that is the Arabic language. Now, firstly, not all people that speak Arabic are Muslim. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his own family, who spoke Arabic better than the Arabs do today, many of them fought against him and did not become Muslim. So just because somebody is an Arab does not mean that they are by default a Muslim. In fact, most Muslims are not Arab, although most Arabs are Muslim. But not all Arabs are Muslim. And when it comes to Allah sending a final messenger to all of humanity, if he's going to be a human being that comes from the lineage of Adam السلام, the first human being, then he's going to come from some tribe, some nation, some ethnicity, some culture. So Allah, with his perfect wisdom, sent his final messenger, 
to come from the Arabs. And the Arabic language at that time was the most eloquent of languages. Thus, the Quran itself is a miracle in and of itself because its eloquence is beyond human capability. Hence, Allah says in the Quran, and if you are in doubt about what we have sent down, referring to the Quran, upon our servant, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then produce a surah, produce a chapter, the like thereof, and call upon your witnesses, other than Allah, if you should be truthful. But if you do not, and you will never be able to, then fear the fire whose fuel is people and stones prepared for the disbelievers. So Allah sent his final book in the Arabic language, and this is why Muslims learn Arabic. It's to understand the preserved word of Allah, our Creator. So even as a Muslim, when we are studying the Arabic language, we're not studying the type of Arabic that Arabs themselves use to converse in their day-to-day -day lives. And if we go down this line of thinking of wanting a prophet who spoke our language or was from our ethnicity, then hypothetically speaking, let's imagine that Allah did send a messenger who was black, who was African. And by the way, I should mention that throughout history, every nation did receive a messenger. Allah tells us in the Quran, and we certainly sent into every nation a messenger. And not only that, but they also spoke the language of their people, as Allah tells us also in the Quran, and we did not send any messenger except speaking in the language of his people to state clearly for them. However, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the final messenger, and something unique about him is that he was sent for all of mankind. The deluge was of Muslims responding to comments he had made, which at the time I had not heard, but the Muslim responses to our brother were uniformly negative. The responses resoundly condemned our brother, Dr. Umar Johnson, for his comments on Islam. As Muslims, we want to say that Dr. Johnson is wrong, and we want to give all these reasons of why. But what we need to do is ask why Dr. Umar Johnson does not separate culture and Islam. And the reason is, in Sunnism, there is Sunnah of worship and Sunnah of culture. The things that the Prophet had done, والسلام, either they are Sunnah of worship or Sunnah of culture. And many Sunnis do not separate what is Sunnah of worship and what is Sunnah of culture, which allows them to believe that Muslims must follow everything Prophet Muhammad did, whether it's Sunnah of worship or Sunnah of culture. Some scholars say we should follow in everything whether it's Sunnah of worship or Sunnah of culture. So maybe Dr. Umar Johnson did leave Islam when he left culture. And there were charges that he does not know what he's talking about and he doesn't know Islam, so he should stay in his lane. And there was quite a bit of upset or at least I would say ruffled feathers caused by whatever our brother had said. The pitch got high enough that it piqued my interest. In that Muslims responded, I didn't get all of their responses. I didn't hear everything, but you know, he just said African spirituality is his way now, but he's speaking pure English right now. Every time I heard him, I don't hear him speaking the the uh, languages of Africa. In, in other words, I, I'm, I'm going to that clip where he, well, that part of the clip where he said, uh, well, I got to talk Arab or Arabic, Arabic. Um, but anyway, I think that when I'm hearing him, this, he's brought this up before. He's brought this up before, at least two or three times that I remember. And... Um, I've mentioned before his name. I, when I first got wind of him as a person, he was Umar Abdullah Johnson. And then he just shortened it to Umar Johnson or Dr. Umar. So um, in those other clips, you know, he made clear he was born in a Muslim family. I think that his critique, as I have heard it and like on this one, um, you know, I think that we as African-American Muslims, we love our religion. 
and we know the value of our religion. Um, but I think one of the things that our religion uh, impresses upon us to be is objective and sensitive and to really hear with our head and heart. Listen with our head and heart. And I think if we do that, I think he has a point, though he's not 100 percent correct. He's wrong, too. He's wrong in the sense that Islam is not an Arab religion. All Muslims know this. Uh, Islam is not an Arab religion. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, the continent of Africa played a very important role in the history of Islam since the beginning, since the inception of Islam. For example, before the Muslims made Hijra to Medina, which was known as Yathrib at that time, uh, the first Hijra was to uh, Abyssinia, Ethiopia today. Uh, and they were they were under the protection of a Christian of the Christian king who was an African man. Um, so Islam was in Africa before it even went to other parts of Arabia. The uh, history of Islam in West Africa is well known. We know, according to documented history, that 20 to 40 percent as a low estimate of the Muslims brought to the Americas were Muslim. So he being a scholar, he's a psychologist by training, but he's a scholar in general of, 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 of the African diaspora. He speaks on that. I'm sure he knows these things. I'm sure he knows it. Um, so Africa and Arabia, even culturally, you know, again, there is a there is there has been among scholars, uh, anthropologists um, um, and historians, too. The uh, they have made they have taken notice of the fact that certain parts or groups among the Arabs and in certain regions like in southern Arabia, the language, the music styles, even the dress mirrors what's in East Africa. Like, for example, the Arabic language is a sister language of what they call the Ethiopic Semitic, I think is the expression, um, which is spoken in East Africa. They have the same patterns, the root systems, etc. So there's some clear overlap there. Our dear brother said a mouthful in that very brief clip. Again, I stressed it. I can find no error in what our brother said. And so I would like to add to his comments, I hope maybe I can add something to his understanding, which doesn't take from what he said, but adds to what he said, inshallah. So a number of words were Put on the table. Again, our brother was a Muslim early in his years, but he had to walk away from the Islam that he was raised in because he felt that he was a practicing Arab. His words, he wasn't a Muslim. He was, he felt like a practicing Arab. He said, Islam as he experienced it and as he observed it is not the worship of God, but is the deification of Arab culture. We're going to come back to that. What I would off for my brother he said that not wanting to be a practicing arab or arab not wanting to deify arab culture under the guise false guise of worshiping god he left Islam and now he is practicing African spirituality.
what I would like to suggest to our brother, he said he was a <laughs> not a practicing Muslim, but a practicing Arab, or in his language, Arab. But he left that and is now now african spirituality is his foundation he said what i would like to offer to us is that islam is african spirituality i don't just declare that, pontificate that. I have by large grace demonstrated that. Not Islam today. We'll get to that in a moment, inshallah. Our brother's critique of Islam today is on point. What I am adding to our brother's perspective is the fact that the Islam of the world today is the result of a hijacking of Islam yesterday. A hijacking of Islam, which in its original formulation was absolutely an African spirituality. In my book, Black Arabia and the African Origin of Islam, which dear brother, Dr. Umar, I'm happy to send to you. It is demonstrated that Islam born in the Arabian cradle, but the Arabian cradle is geomorphically, ethnologically, climatologically, and a, a northeastern extension of that area we now call Africa. I by Allah's grace, have demonstrated in a recent report, Allah and the sacred science of the black God in African traditional religion. The book is available on our website, drwesley.info. The report is available. You can, we will make this, we're happy to make the report and the book available to our brother to add to his perspective, not necessarily to correct his perspective. But it is a demonstrable fact that Islam, before its hijacking, was absolutely and a form of African spirituality in Arabia and African spirituality on the European European continent of Africa. What do I mean the European continent of Africa? The Africa, be real clear. If your Africa stops west of the Red Sea, your Africa is the white man's Africa. It's European cartographers or map makers that made the arbitrary decision to end Africa west of the Red Sea and begin Asia east of the Red Sea with Arabia. 
making Arabia the doorway to Asia and Northeastern Africa, the limit of Africa. God didn't do that. That's not God's Africa. All of the physical sciences, linguistic and ethnological science, sciences prove conclusively that Africa extends across the Red Sea. So if your Africa stops at the limit of the western coast of the Red Sea, you are glorifying Europe's Africa. But the land mass that God produced that was later named Africa, the area that we now call the Arabian Peninsula was a part of God's Africa. Africa was robbed of it by European cartographers. Islam as an African spirituality. Arabic, the language of Arabic, is not a so-called Arab language. The language of Arabic is as African as is Kiswahili, the language of Arabic is as African a language as is Zulu. That is a fact. And we have demonstrated the African context of not just Arabic, but Hebrew and all of the so-called Semitic languages. So it is not anti-African or even non-African to offer prayers to God in Arabic. It is profoundly African to do so, though. I get your point. Why can't I honor God in the language that I speak. And so Allah says in the Quran that he sends messengers to every people on the earth and they speak the language of the people. So your point was well made. It should not be. The knowledge of Arabic or the lack thereof should not be presented as an obstacle to communicating with God, but the point must be made that by calling on God in Arabic is absolutely calling on God in a bona fide African language. And by calling on God in a African language, you're calling on in Islam what could be properly described as an African God or better power African God or global African God. What does power African mean? African but beyond African. We have demonstrated that the Name, the divine name Allah is not a Johnny come lately era name. It is a global name found among African peoples on the continent and distributed around the globe. When you are, when we call on Allah. We are calling on a bona fide God of African people. Now, most don't know that because the evolution of languages has concealed that fact. But 
when you call on Olodumare, your Yoruba is an African spirituality and the chief god of the Yoruba is Olodumare. What you might not know is when you call on Olodumare, you are ipso facto calling on Allah linguistically. The divine name Olodumare is a compound of Olu and Damaros. Damaros lightly derives from the Bantu Mare shining. That Olu, meaning God, is rooted in the Proto Bantu word Ulu, meaning God, which is cognate with the Proto Semitic Allah. And we have demonstrated that the ultimate root of both the proto-bantu ulu with its vowel change which happens in evolutionary linguistics and the proto-semitic allah they both de derive from an ancient allah root so the root of the word olu in the divine name olo dumare the root word, the root name is Allah. The vowel changes conceal that fact. Olo Dumare, God can be and has been translated as God in shining robes, but God here is Allah, which evolved to Olu. When you call on, Unkulunkulu, the chief god of the Zulu of South Africa. Unkulunkulu, we have demonstrated the linguistic relationship between, for example, the language of the Zulu, which is a Bantu language, a Niger Congo language and the language of the ancient Sumerians, the ancient black peoples of ancient Mesopotamia. The Zulu language and the Sumerian language, they are cognate languages. And the divine name Unkulunkulu in Zulu. Is the same as is cognate with the Sumerian name An Gal Gal. Now, both of these are compound words. Unkulun Kulu has been broken up into the divine name Un, joined by the word. Kulu, which means great in Zulu, when it is in reduplicated form, when the word is duplicated, this is a linguistic technique of signifying emphasis or the superlative. So Kulu means great, Kulu Kulu or Kulun Kulu reduplicated, the two words or the word duplicated means greatest. So unkulun kulu means God is greatest. The same with the Sumerian. An is the chief God of the ancient Sumerians. And Gal is the same as the Zulu kulu. Gal means great and reduplicated gal gal means greatest so both the zulu unkulun kulu means god is greatest and the sumerian on gal gal means god is greatest but what's important is evolutionary linguistics conceals the fact that the un the zulu un derives from an Allah root. The vowels 
not only did the vowel change from A to U, but due to a linguistic process called nasalization, when under certain circumstances, the L would transform into an N. This is what happened in Zulu, and this is what happened in Sumerian. So the Sumerian An is rooted in the God name Allah. And the Zulu Un is rooted in the God name Allah. And so Unkulunkulu means the same thing as the Arabic Allahu Akbar. God is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. Unkulunkulu, Allah is the greatest. Allahu Akbar. The Sumerian An Gal Gal, God is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. Allahu Akbar. So you don't get no more African than Unkulunkulu of the Zulus, An Gal Gal of the Sumerians, or Olodumare of the Yoruba. And in each case, when you say each name, you are ipso facto invoking the name Allah. Allah is the God of global African people. And we demonstrated this both in our book and in our report. 